There were 12 of us to begin with, by Ian Gordon. With thanks to our producers, Ashley Lindsay, Robert Daniel Picard, Wes Sale, and Cameron Seegers. Chapter 4 Longhorn, December 28, 1989. The Invisible Dead. This, a comment made by the grinning Andrina in reference to the recently departed Grey Dagger, was the utterance that sent the excitable Green Drake dashing from the dining room in the direction of the library, following a half-eaten breakfast on the morning of the 28th. Bewildered, the other contestants followed in his wake, even White Admiral, whose hangover-induced toast consumption was no longer a priority. Reaching the chilly library, the guests crowded around the reading table besides Green Drake, who, clutching a cigarette lighter, was in the act of lighting one of the many church candles that had been dotted throughout the Grand Hall. "'What are you doing?' quizzed White Admiral, still chewing his last mouthful of toast. "'The Invisible Dead,' Green Drake returned between heavy breaths. "'Don't you see?' And they did see. Talk of invisibility had inspired the man in the gaudy dress shirt to bring the book's blank pages into close proximity with a naked flame, in order to reveal, in invisible ink, anything that might be written there. And sure enough, a short sentence was dimly revealed on the first of the green book's blank pages. Excitably, Green Drake read the words aloud. The moth sleeps like the dead. A moment of tense silence followed permeated only by the sound of White Admiral's incessant chewing. "'The bed!' Green Drake suddenly shouted. "'We need to take a closer look at the bed!' "'Whose bed?' Scarlet Darter blurted. His question went unanswered. Once more the impulsive man took off at the speed of sound, out of the library, into the grand hall, and up the stairs, three at a time. And again the other contestants followed, some intrigued, some positively bemused. The guests in pursuit, Nightcrawler, White Admiral, Andrina, Scarlet Darter, False Widow, New Forest, Yellow Jacket, Blue Bottle, and Black Garden, located Green Drake in the empty quarters of the missing Grey Dagger. Standing by her bed, he was in the act of carefully pulling back the plump duvet. Beneath the covers, in the centre of the bed, in stark contrast to the white sheets, lay the slight and distinctive form of a preserved black beetle. "'Is it dead?' asked Yellow Jacket, wincing at the sight of the creature. "'Quite,' Green Drake said, prodding the insect. "'Wouldn't be much of a clue if it could just crawl away now, would it?' "'Clue?' mumbled Nightcrawler, a look of confusion filling his face. Green Drake turned to him. "'It's a beetle,' he said, matter-of-factly. "'So?' This from False Widow. "'A longhorn beetle,' Green Drake continued. "'A dead one at that.' Yellow Jacket gawped at the insect. If it's a clue about Longhorn, she began, then what's it doing in Grey Dagger's bed? In all likelihood, New Forest offered, the pointer's in the direction of the next victim. Yeah, Green Drake agreed. A warning of sorts. As he spoke, he turned to survey his present company in search of Longhorn, but the lady with the dark hair and round rimmed glasses wasn't among them. Has anybody seen Longhorn? he asked but the silent shrugs he received in return spoke louder than words. Just when exactly Longhorn had vanished, none of the remaining participants could attest, and it soon became clear that none of the participants had any recollections of seeing her that morning, and that none of them could remember even approximately when they'd last seen her. And so it was assumed that Longhorn was the second stooge, the second victim of the would-be killer, the killer who had promised, in writing, to pick them off one by one. But at the very least they had clues now, in the form of the invisible ink and the preserved beetle. Other clues would be forthcoming too, if, of course, they kept their wits about them. It was through a process of deduction that the ten remaining guests stumbled upon the third clue. White Admiral, the anxious drunk, recalled Longhorn excusing herself from the kitchen a little after six p.m. the previous evening, in order to, and he quoted, 
visit the little girl's room. Revealing to the rest of the contestants his suspicions regarding both her and Grey Dagger, he said he'd watched her leave the kitchen and walk not in the direction of the water closet next door, but along the corridor to the east, towards the library. It was just a glance, he said, but felt that her deception was very typical of a stooge's behaviour. I didn't dwell on it, he added. In fact, I think that was around the time we cracked open the port. Encouraged by White Admiral's recollections, the contestants, some of whom were quietly nursing unwelcome forebodings, had returned once again to the library, in search of evidence surrounding Longhorn's disappearance. Following Green Drake's subsequent attempts to reveal further hidden messages upon the blank pages of the guidebook, a general sweep of the lower level revealed nothing of note. New Forest, however, took it upon herself to climb the spiral staircase in the northwest corner, and, a couple of minutes after doing so, found herself addressing her counterparts below. Hey! she yelled. Up here! Moments later, the ten contestants of Murder at Miller's Manor were gazing at the spine of a dislodged book among the hundreds and hundreds filling the shelves along the west wall. The book was protected by a bright yellow dust jacket, though the dust jacket itself had evidently not been protected from whatever had caused the shiny crimson smears that peppered it. "'Is that blood?' Andrina stammered, the usual warmth in her voice completely absent. "'It looks like blood.' False Widow said, her curious hand extending unconsciously towards the soiled item. Wait, Nightcrawler blurted, producing a handkerchief. Allow me. With a handkerchief covering his hand, the tallest of the guests extracted the blood-stained volume from the shelf, and, followed by the other contestants, returned to the lower floor, in order to place it alongside the guidebook on the reading table. The ever-enthusiastic Green Drake shoved his way to the front of the group, and immediately began leafing through the tome, only to be frustrated when his quest for information yielded nothing but a series of blank pages. The candle flame revealed nothing in the form of invisible ink, either. The dust jacket, Yellow Jacket muttered to herself, as something seemingly very obvious dawned upon her. What? came the exasperated tones of Green Drake. The dust jacket, she repeated. It's yellow. And bloodstained. This from Scarlet Darter, who, in his deep contemplation, was again twisting the end of his moustache. Directing the question at nobody in particular, Yellow Jacket asked, Does that mean I'm next? White Admiral stepped forward. I don't know, he said. Are you a stooge? Yellow Jacket shook her head, but all present could see quite clearly that White Admiral wasn't convinced. And then it was Black Garden who stepped forward who, other than supplying the occasional yes or no to questions put to him, had been little more than a shadowy background character in the game thus far. Not likely, he said, in answer to White Admiral's question. I mean, we all drew names from a hat. Meaning? asked White Admiral, seeking clarification. But I watched Yellow Jacket draw her name from the hat. There was no trickery. And, as the man in the Fair Isle cardigan spoke— White Admiral's gaze returned to the attractive thirty-something, who, under the intensity of his mildly hungover glare, seemed to be retreating into an invisible realm of uncertainty. He saw genuine fear in her dark eyes, but, also, as he looked at her, he felt the familiar flutter of butterflies in the pit of his stomach, telling him something was wrong. But it was just a game, he reminded himself. The Stooges were simply actors— wasn't it probable, he considered, that from time to time stooges would employ basic sleight of hand in order to assure certain outcomes? That had assuredly been the case with Grey Dagger and Longhorn, who had been the first to draw their names from the top hat on the twenty-sixth. Yes, all very probable. White Admiral had a third suspect now, someone else to keep his eye on. Just where the other two had ended up he hadn't a clue, although he was reasonably sure, thanks to the storm— that they hadn't ventured beyond the walls of the mansion. And what a storm it was! The snow had been coming down in vast clouds for days, forming drifts along the exterior of the property, blotting out daylight on the ground floor. Contact with the outside world was completely out of the question. Miller's manor was without a telephone line, and the roads were unnavigable. 
Black Garden, who had apparently become rather protective of the suddenly timid Yellow Jacket, spoke up once again. If Yellow Jacket is the next victim, then we have a duty to keep an eye on her. Yes, Green Drake agreed, his face a mask of fervour. And in doing so, we might just have an opportunity to catch our mysterious killer in the act. Yellow Jacket said nothing whatsoever. She just eyeballed the other contestants, nine strangers in her midst, two others missing, and an invisible host, a killer lurking in the shadows. The attractive thirty-something shuddered, and then darkness. Thanks for listening today, ladies and gents. Be sure to join us again tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the next part of There Were Twelve of Us to Begin With. And until then, 